song service that he offered to us this morning or this evening. It's definitely nice to be here. I was. It's always bittersweet when the Sunday rolls around where I go to Stillwater because I do love meeting with the brethren up there and being able to, to worship with them, build relationships, but it means that I don't get to worship here in the morning, and that's always the bitter part of it. I, I really enjoy being with you. The singing is so great, and everybody lifting their voices together, the fellowship that we have and, and the love we have for one another is always something special that we need to, uh, to recognize that that's not like that everywhere, you know, but it's, it's definitely special here. I want to take a few minutes of our time, if you would, this evening to talk about repentance. And Kelvin kind of helped prepare our minds for uh, thinking about repentance and what the sermon is going to be about with his song service this, this evening. But I do want to talk about this, and the reason why I want to talk about this is because in, within our brethren, I think sometimes repentance is thought of in a way that the Bible doesn't necessarily portray it. And I don't mean that you know we all have the wrong idea and that I'm going to get up here and preach something you've never heard before. Chances are this is something quite a bit of us will relate to, quite a bit of us will understand, and, and it'll be something we've heard before. But I think too often I've talked to people about the idea of repentance, and it's almost as if repentance is just an action that a Christian does. Or especially I've heard some people say that it's just a one-time thing that we do. And so, so in hearing those things, it's important to know what the Bible has to say. Does the Bible portray it as something that's just a one-time action? And I think the reason why some think this way, and the reason why it's kind of uh, understood this way by some, is because we in the Church of Christ, especially within uh, our, our preachers and everything, we've developed uh, a list that we accept that we call the plan of salvation. And it is that we hear the Word of God, and if we've heard the Word of God, we believe it. And if we believe it, we need to repent. Once we've repent, we confess our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we're baptized for the remission of our sins. And don't get me wrong, I'm not disagreeing in any way with that plan of salvation. That's a very biblical, scriptural plan. We find all of those things in Scripture that this is the way that one gets themselves to a, a removal of their sins, a, an initial forgiveness and that initial salvation of their souls. So, I do agree with that, but I think sometimes we take that list and because we put them up like a list, we kind of think of it like it's a checklist. Okay, I've heard the Word of God, check. Do I believe it? Yes, check. Okay, what's the next step? Repent. Okay, I repent, check. And then you move on, confess, check, baptize, check. I'm done, I'm good. You know, and sometimes I think we do see it as a checklist and because of that, repentance being kind of in that list that we like to talk about, repentance kind of gets pushed into something that's just a one-time thing. Or repentance is something we think, uh, okay, what's next on the list? Okay, repent, so I'll repent, and then I move on. But that's not what repentance is. So this, this evening I want to look at, first, let's define repentance from the Scripture. Then let's look at what the importance of repentance is. And I think in defining it, we, our minds will kind of already be going to why it's important, because we know what it is. But we'll go to look at why it's important, and then after that we're going to look at some works that are befitting of repentance. The Bible talks about that. The Bible says that when we repent, we must bear fruits worthy or, or work worthy of, those, uh, of that repentance. So we'll talk about what that means biblically. It's not, my, it's not my objective at all to tell you what I think repentance is or what I wish it was or anything like that. It's my objective to share with you a Bible study on what God's Word has to say about this topic of repentance. So with that being said, I'd ask you to open your Bibles. Follow along with everything that's said. If you have any questions, if you've heard it a different way and, 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 or it's just not making sense in your mind, don't hesitate to ask any questions. If we're not asking questions and we keep those thoughts and concerns to ourselves, one or both of us has not come to the full truth on what repentance truly is. So don't hesitate to ask those questions and, and we can study together. So open your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, this was the, the, the passage for our scripture reading, and we'll get back to it more in depth uh, in our sermon on the second slide, uh, or, or our point about importance on repentance. But look at verse 30. Verse 30, it, it reads, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, or the King James Version said, winked at. But truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. So that first tells me something, that I need to know what repentance is because I am commanded to repent. I am commanded to it. All men are commanded to repent. And look at verse 31. Verse 31 gives us the reason why. 
The reason why is because God has appointed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained, that's Jesus Christ, whom He has given assurance to this to all by raising Christ from the dead. So we know that repentance is something very important. It's commanded of all men everywhere, and the reason is because God's going to judge the world. Because He has, uh, he has given us assurance of that by raising Christ from the dead, that's through, uh, through Christ we will be judged. And so this tells me repentance has something to do with my eternal life. It has something to do on where I'll be placed in, on Judgment Day. So I need to look at it. What is it? Repentance, let's look first at the fact that repentance is not just a one-time action. Repentance is not just that thing that we check off the list of our salvation and we've done it, so we're good and we don't have to look back to it. Okay, Repentance involves initially, however, let's look at initial repentance and later we'll get into looking at a, uh, a repentance after this initial repentance where we come to Christ for the first time. And that is that it is a change. We're going to see repentance as being a change. Look at Acts chapter 2. We know what happens in Acts chapter 2, right? Peter preaches the, or Peter and the rest of the apostles are preaching the first gospel sermon. And they're preaching uh, and, and telling the men in verse 36 that Jesus, whom they crucified, God made both Lord and Savior, right? And so he, he's explaining them to this. And when he gets to that conclusion, the people there were cut to the heart. They believed that they understood the wrong that they had done. They understood that they were in sin and they didn't know what to do. And so that's what they asked Peter and the rest of the apostles. In verse 37, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter tells them in verse 38, you need to repent and be baptized, right? For the remission, or in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, the reason this might, you know, it might be kind of wondering, well, how does this tell us what the definition of repentance is in Acts chapter 2? That just tells us that we need to repent when we're in sin. Well, first of all, that's right. Repentance is done when we are in sin. But the definition, I think, comes from the context. Look at who the apostles are talking to. They're accused of being the very ones uh, that, that crucified Christ, or at least the same nation of people that were involved in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. They thought of Him as somebody who was a blasphemer. They did not see Him as the Christ, the Messiah of promise that was to come. They didn't see Him that way. They didn't believe in Him or His teachings. But they thought he was a blasphemer. So they, they called to Pilate. They're mad at his teachings. They're mad at the things that he's done and the things that he's claimed. And so they go to Pilate and they want this man crucified. And they get him crucified. Okay, so these are people that did not believe in Jesus. They did not believe that he was who he was saying he was. And they were people who ultimately put him to death. Now where does the repentance come in? The repentance comes in now that they are going to have to change that, aren't they? When they hear Peter talking and when they hear Peter preaching that Jesus, whom they crucified, God has made both Lord and Savior, they think, wow, we've messed up. That's their change in belief on who Jesus Christ is. They now believe, they, they should have believed, they should have seen it from the first, especially being those who were versed in the prophecies. But they didn't see it. And so where does the change, where does the repentance come in in this case? Well, they repent of of, of their disbelief. They repent and they turn to Him. They now believe in Jesus Christ. And they believe uh, how sin separates them from God and they have a different understanding in that. They've changed in that way. So repentance to me, when I read the Scriptures, I think, well, repentance is a change in my mindset. A, 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 repentance is a change on what I see as important and even on belief that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's different than before. That's a change that takes place. But it's not just in mindset. Repentance, of course, is a change in action as well. A turning from one thing to another. Look at Acts chapter 26 and verse 20. When Luke's going through the life of the Apostle Paul, we read this, that he first declared to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. We'll talk about those works later in the lesson. Look at verse 21. For these reasons the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. So the Apostle Paul is saying that because he has taught this and because the Jews don't like this and they don't accept they tried to kill him. But what was it that he was teaching? He was teaching repentance. They should repent. And now he explains what that is. He says that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. Now, if you are talking about turning to something, 
you automatically have to put together the fact that you're turning away from something. If you are walking this way, and I turn to God, you know, metaphorically obviously, as I walk across the stage, and I turn, well, I had to turn away from walking that way. You have to turn away from something in order to turn to something. What are they turning away from? They're turning away from their sin. They're turning away from their disbelief. They're turning away from that past lifestyle that did not follow Jesus Christ, and they are turning to God. That's what repentance is. It's a complete change. It's a 180. People talk about repentance as being, you know, if, if you were going east, and you, you're going east, and then you turn around and you go west, and you don't go back east, right? You're a complete opposite direction. You leave those things behind, and you go a different direction. That's what repentance is. Repentance is a change. It's a change in our mindset. It's a change in our belief. It's a change in the way we think about things. And it's a change in our action. Right? We do works now after we have turned to God that are befitting repentance. And again, we'll talk about those later in the lesson. That's what repentance is. Another cool thing about the definition of repentance is that it's prompted by something. Repentance is not something that just comes out of the blue, out of nowhere, and it just happens. Okay? Repentance is brought on by godly sorrow. That's what we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. The Apostle Paul, when he's writing to Corinth here in chapter 7, verse 10, says, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So we see here in, in this verse, there are two different sorrows being talked about. The sorrow of this world and godly sorrow. Well, the sorrow of this world would be getting caught up on the things of this world. And, and, and some people say, I don't drive a nice enough car. I don't live in a nice enough house. I don't wear nice enough clothes. I don't make enough money. I don't like the job that I've got. I, I hate this and I hate that. And I'm just not comfortable where I am in my material world of life. And that can make one sorrowful. right? And if they let that be what bogs them down and depresses them, their mindset's in the wrong place. And that's not the sorrow that a Christian needs to have. The sorrow that a Christian needs to feel is a godly sorrow. A sorrow that is prompted by, by godly things. Whether there's sin that we see around us, if there's sin within ourselves that we see, we should be sorrowful. Because we understand how that separates us from our God, our Father in Heaven. That's godly sorrow. So repentance, when one decides to repent, it is prompted by the fact that they have this godly sorrow. And, and true repentance, you know, Kelvin will sing a song for our invitation song, Did You Repent? Fully repent. The idea of a full repentance, I think, doesn't exist in the Bible anywhere. I think a full repentance means repentance. There's not a half repentance. There's not a quarter repentance. There is only true full repentance. And I think that's what the song is trying to say. Did you repent? But did you really repent? Did you actually repent? repent. And that's what the song there is trying to say. But what we understand is that is, of course, brought on by a godly sorrow. Were you sorrowful and did you recognize the fact that your sins were separating you from God? And did that prompt you to repent of those sins? Repentance is a change. It's a turning to God and you have to turn away from something. And there's three things I've got listed up here. This is not from Scripture. This is just me and my thought process through the whole thing. So take this for what it is. But when we look at this, I think there's a few different things that people might have to turn from in our society that I see around us. One of those things is a willful rejection of God. Sometimes I think what happens is people know there's a God. They, they, they believe there's a God. They've heard the Word, but they just willfully reject it. They don't want to have anything to do with it. It's your people that, that, that absolutely just reject it completely. They've got to repent from that. They've got to turn away from their willful rejection. And they've got to turn to God. Another one that we see is ignorance. Some people say, well, I just don't know what the Bible says. You know, I'd, I'd like to be a Christian, but I didn't grow up in the church. My parents didn't read me the Bible. I don't know what it says, and it seems hard to understand. So I, I'm ignorant to what the Bible says. I'm ignorant to what I'm supposed to do. And they, they use that as almost an excuse. Well, they've got to repent of that ignorance. Turn away from your ignorance and turn to God. Study the Bible. Know His Word. Seek it and ye shall find it. Right? And that's what we see. So sometimes we might have to repent from an ignorance and, and turn to God from that. Turn, and not, and we're not repenting of our sins. We're turning away from our ignorance is my point. And sometimes it's a disinterest. 
a lot of my friends I've known are simply not interested in talking about biblical things. And I'm sure there's a lot of you that can relate to that. You meet a lot of people and they're just simply not going to talk to you about biblical things. They're disinterested in it. They, they don't care about it. It's not even something that's running through their head. They're fine with life the way it is and they don't want to they, they don't want to know. They don't want to talk to you about it. They need to turn away from that disinterest. If you find yourself disinterested, turn away from your disinterest and turn to God. But repentance is something that we do when we find ourselves lost in sin. We know there's sin in our lives. Godly sorrow exists because we recognize our sin and we repent. We turn away from that sin and we change our actions, we change our mind toward it, and we turn to God. That's what repentance is is. So what's the importance of it? Now like I said, as we go through the definition, we can kind of understand the importance of it, right? We can't continue to walk in sin and walk with God at the same time. We know that that, that God does not abide in sin in any way, shape, or form. He cannot abide in sin. So if, he's, if we're walking with sin, we can't be walking with Christ. We have to turn. That's the importance of repentance. We need to turn to God. It is His will for all man. We're familiar with 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, right? When Peter's talking about the judgment day and the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night, and we're not going to know the day or the hour that he comes. And in verse 9, he says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he is long suffering, meaning he's patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, it is His will for all men. We want to know why it's important? That's why. Because God wishes it for every single man. Look at, uh, look at what we find in Acts 17 like we read in our Scripture we read at the beginning of the lesson. It's a commandment from God that all men repent. We are commanded. Every single man commanded to repent. What does this mean? Well, this means that if we don't, we have not obeyed the commandments of God. Right? And how do we know God? We know God if we keep His commandments. Okay? And so we're not going to be able to know God, be in a right relationship with God, and expect salvation for our souls on the last day if we do not obey His commandments. It's something that we are commanded to do. That's why it's important. But that doesn't mean that since God commanded it of me, I check it off the list and okay, I've repented and I'm done with repentance. I've got that. I've obeyed the commandment and I've moved on. This is a complete turning away from our sins. And, and I don't know about you, but I definitely am not perfect. I never have been perfect, and I never will be perfect. And neither will any man other than Jesus Christ Himself when He walked in the flesh. And so because we're not perfect, and because we sin, and we fall short of the glory of God, we have to repent of those sins. It's not a one-time thing that we do before we're baptized. It's not a one-time thing that we do saying initially deciding that we're going to serve our Lord. That's part of it. But what about the Christian who's been baptized and they sin or they get caught up in a sin, right? They're, they're overtaken in a trespass in some way. What do they have to do? They've got to repent. They have to turn away from that sin that they're committing, leave it away, let it pass away, and turn to God. That's something that we have to do even after we've been Christians. Anytime that we see ourselves in sin, we have to repent of that sin. It's very important. It, it helps to God to be able to forgive of our sins. We always pray about that, right? That, that uh, Father, we pray right, that, that You forgive us our sins as we repent of them. right? And that's a good prayer. That's something that we are recognizing in prayer to God that we, we know that we have to repent of our sins in order to be justly forgiven uh, of Him. It's commanded. It's something that's very important. And it's required for our salvation. This is initially, of course, the initial removal of our sins in baptism, right? That Peter talked about in, in Acts 2.38. They had to repent and be baptized. That was what they had to do. There, there was no other alternative. They couldn't be baptized and have their sins washed away. And then three months later, if they decide to stop doing all the stuff they were doing before, then they can go ahead and make that decision. That's not how it worked. Peter said they needed to repent. They needed to change their mindset. They needed to change their action. They needed to turn to God and they needed to be baptized to have those sins of the past and that old man be put to death and that, so that they can walk in newness of life. And without this repentance, without those sins removed from our account, we are going to perish. Look at Luke chapter 13. This is the very words of Christ. You know, sometimes people have an issue with accepting the words of the apostles for whatever reason, but a lot of the religious world will say, 
if the words are written in red, I'm going to listen to them. And so here they are. Here's the words written in red about repentance from Jesus Christ Himself. Look at verse 3. I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Look at verse 5. I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will also likewise perish. And we don't have time to really get into the context of what's being talked about here. But Jesus is being asked questions. He's having to do some teaching. And in this teaching, He talks about the fact that if we do not repent, we will likewise perish perish we will perish without repentance why because our sins have not been removed because we have not turned away from sin and turned to God we are still living in that sin and we know that there is no salvation for our souls if we are continuing to live in sin that's the importance of repentance that's why we have to repent because we need our sins cleansed from us in order to be in a right relationship or to be in fellowship with our God in heaven that's the importance of it so what are the works befitting repentance? I've, I've heard some sermons about this and I've heard some studies and a lot of people say, well, here's several works that show somebody has repented. You can see it in their lives and, and maybe it's just that I'm not experienced enough and haven't seen enough yet in my life to make a list like that. But I just don't see a list like that necessarily given in Scripture. That, well, if you see them sitting in the church pew more, you know they've repented. Well, if you see them uh, not hanging around the same people, maybe probably they've repented. Now, I don't necessarily see those things in Scripture. Those are good things. And that might show you, hey, this person you know, maybe is taking things a little bit more seriously. But I, I don't find that really in the Scriptures. In Luke chapter 3, I do find some works that befit repentance. In Luke chapter 3 and verse 1, it kind of starts to give us the, uh, the history of how things happen. But we'll pick up our reading in verse 3. Okay? In verse 3, we, we're seeing, of course, John the baptizer. Okay, John the Baptist, we know that he is the one that paved the way for Jesus with the baptism of repentance, right, for the remission of our sins. So he paved the way for Christ and the baptism that would be in his name later on. Look at verse 3. And he went into all the region of the Jordan, preaching, and bab- uh, preaching, and bapti- uh, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And then verse 4, it goes into the prophecy. Let's Skip down there to save some time. We got into verse 7, okay? And then he said to the multitude, that's just showing the prophecy of how John uh, was one who fulfilled that prophecy as was, as was said. In verse 7 it says, Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers. Brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So what is John saying here? John's saying you have to repent. Okay, John is saying you are a brood of vipers. Who told you of this wrath to come that you want to escape? And he says you have to repent. And he says that they can't say that Abraham was their father. It's interesting, that point. The Jews thought because they were direct uh, lineage of Abraham, that Abraham was their literal physical uh, ancestor and father, that that, that they they were a chosen people, they were a special people, they were set aside in any way. And John's saying, you can't use that as an excuse anymore. You can't say that Abraham was your father because God is not making that uh, that, uh, separation anymore. And, and the point's made there that, that they just can't do that. He's basically saying it doesn't matter who your daddy is. You know, I think we've wanted to say that sometimes to a few people. I don't care who your daddy is. You know, you can't use that anymore. That's kind of what he's saying to the Jews. It doesn't matter that you are descendants of Abraham. And he makes the comparison there to a tree that doesn't bear good fruit. Right now, the tree literally isn't meaning a tree. It's making a comparison to us, to people, right? He says a tree that does not bear good fruit, what's going to happen to it? It's going to be cut down by the axe and it's going to be thrown into the fire. But they wouldn't do that to a tree that's bearing good fruit. That tree is profitable. That tree is doing something good for them. And they're not going to cast that out. Look at verse 10. So the people asked Him saying, What shall we do? I love these questions. When you read the question, What shall we do in Scripture as you go through a Bible study? It's amazing to me because I can hold that Bible in my hand in the form of of paper, in the form of an iPad, in the form of a computer, or however else I want to look up this Word. And it's so incredibly accessible to me that I don't really have to ask that question, what shall I do, and really wonder about it. Because if I do, I can read the answer. So the people say, 
what must we do? And he says uh, to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. These are starting to sound like maybe works that they're doing that's befitting the repentance he told them to repent of. These are good things that they need to be doing. And they weren't doing them before. So what are they doing? They're making a change. Tax collectors. What we know about tax collectors was that they were, uh, where they were assigned an amount to go collect from the people. And a lot of times what they would do is they would collect more than they were told to collect because they had the authority to get what they wanted. Okay, And then they would keep the excess for themselves. But he says you need to change what you're doing. Look at verse 12. Then tax collectors came to be baptized and said, What shall we do? And he said, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. That would, be, that would have been a change to the normal tax collector. Then the soldiers asked him what they needed to do. And he said, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. Evidently, that was something that the soldiers were having a problem with. That that's what they were like in the past. But he says, you can't be that way anymore. You need to change. This is the stuff that he's talking about in repentance. And maybe that doesn't apply to us. You know, maybe we're not tax collectors that's collecting more than what we need. Maybe we're not the people that, that, that has two tunics that needs to give some that has none. Most of the people that we know probably has clothing, okay? But that's just our culture. The point is, they are changing. They are becoming a different person. That's a work befitting repentance. And that's what Luke 3 talks about. If you go uh, up about 10 chapters to Luke chapter 3, or we were just in Luke chapter 3, weren't we? I forgot to do that point. <laughs> we already read everything there that I wanted uh, to read. In 1 John chapter 2, that's what I was looking for. Repentance and the works of repentance, and when we know that we have embodied what the song talks about for our invitation, a, a full repentance, or really, like I said, the one true repentance, okay? when we do that, we know that we, have, uh, that, that we, we can have an assurance that we know God. Okay? And, and here's why I say that. It doesn't necessarily exactly say repentance in 1 John 2, 3, but it says that by, uh, that by this we know that we know Him. We have that assurance that we know Him. How? if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him and doesn't keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. So, how does that work with repentance? Well, remember earlier when we talked about repentance being a commandment of God? Now, that's not saying that that the commandment talked about here in 1 John 2-3 is only repentance. It says commandments, plural. All of His commandments. We have to keep His Word. Right? And if we... If we don't keep His Word, but we still say that we know God, we become a liar. We, that's not true. That doesn't work that way. But repentance is definitely one of those things. If we have not repented, or if we uh, initially repented and were baptized, and, and we went on and, and we kind of found ourselves in sin later, and we're not repenting of that sin, we're not getting rid of that sin from our lives and turning away from it, turning to God, no longer walking down that path. If we haven't done that, you cannot say that you know God. Because if you do, it makes you a liar. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be rude or discouraging by saying that. I'm simply trying to tell you what 1 John 2, 3, and 4 is telling you. It's an importance. It's something you need to think about if that, if that is you. In 2 Corinthians 5, I think this is the point that I'm really trying to make with works befitting repentance. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. and I know I'm moving quickly through these verses, but I've got quite a few of them. In, in, in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. A new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation reconciliation or being reconciled, okay, being bought back, being uh, restored out of our sin and into godliness, into fellowship with Him, we have reconciliation through Christ Jesus. But how? We have to repent. We have to become this new creation. When he says that those who are in Christ, verse 17, let me get back there, those who are in Christ, okay, they are a new creation. If you're not a new creation, you're not in Christ. You need to become a new creation. Okay, but if we are, and, and, and a lot of us here uh, have become that new creation, we have been baptized, we have, been, uh, we have decided to follow Him and put away the things of the world. Okay, it, the interesting thing is when we become this new creation or when we repent, 
we have to put the old things away. It says the old things passed away. You know, we recognize through the, through the brevity of this life that when things pass away, and that this world is not eternal, when things pass away, we can't bring them back. That when things die, when things uh, eventually, when their life comes to an end, they're done. We cannot bring them back. That's what repentance is. It says the old things pass away. What does that mean? They don't, we can't bring them back up. When we become this new creation, this new creature, we don't bring up those old things from the past man or that old creature that we once were. The old man, right? Talk about putting away the old man and putting on the new man. That doesn't mean that halfway from the waist up we put on the new man, but from, you know, but what we wear on top of our shirt and our coat, you know, we're still the old man. That doesn't work that way. The old things pass away and all things become new. That's repentance. I have put those old things in that old man and the way that I used to walk according to the flesh, I've let them pass away. I've put them away and I've turned to God. And I am not going back to what that is. And if I do fall and I go back, I repent. I repent. I turn away and I put them away. And I don't go back to it again. We must change. And we can no longer live in the flesh. That's what repentance means. There's a difference between living the way that Christ has you to live or living based on the material possessions or the wants that we have of this flesh. You know, in this world, in this, in this society that we live in, and like again, I'm not bashing society. We're a very successful society as far as the rest of the world goes. We have money, we have things. That, that's a successful society. But it's dangerous for Christians. And here's why. Generally, if we want something, we can go get it. And we're very blessed about that. But I think sadly, that's kind of translated into our spiritual lives sometimes. That when we want something, as human beings, when we have this want, we go get it. Just like we get everything else that we want. And I'm not saying you get everything you want, but really look, you know, if we look at it in reality, in this country, we pretty much have what we want. You know, we, have, we have it really good. And so sometimes I think that that, that attitude kind of translates into, in, into our walk with Christ. That I, I want to fulfill the desires of my flesh, whether that be the lust of the eyes or the lust of the flesh or whatever it is, that, that I, I want to do what I want to do. And so we go do what we want. That's not repentance. That's not a Christian. That's not putting to death the things that I want in following Christ. We have to turn away from ourselves, away from the flesh, away from sin, and turn to Christ. That's what repentance is. It's a U-turn. You know, if you, if you think about when you're driving down the road, and, and I've done this more times than I'd like to admit, but I'm driving down the road and I make a wrong turn when I've gone to this place a hundred times. But I make a wrong turn. And so I start going the wrong direction. And I realize, wait, I need to be going that way. And so you make a U-turn and you start going the right direction. Now, that's what repentance is. You're going the wrong way, you realize you're going the wrong way, and you turn around and you start going the right way. But how foolish would it be if we're driving down the road and we realize, oh, I'm going the wrong way, and you make a U-turn, you start going the other way, and then two miles down the road, you make another U-turn, you start going the wrong way again. We, we've rarely ever done that. I mean, accidents happen when we're driving all the time. We get forgetful. But my point is, when you know now that you're going the right direction, and you know the other direction's wrong, you wouldn't make another U-turn to go back to it. Repentance works the same way. If you've decided to follow Christ, if you know that your sins separate yourself from Him, and it denies the salvation of your soul, and you repent, you make that U-turn, you start going the right direction, but five years later, three years later, six months, a week, an hour later, you make another U-turn, you start doing what's wrong again, that doesn't make any sense. You've recognized your sin. Don't go back to it. That's what repentance is. Peter tells us and the rest of the apostles in Acts chapter 2 that we need to repent of our sins and we need to be baptized. That is, and we talked, you know, this, this evening a little bit about the fact that sometimes it's not, you know, just the initial repentance. That even after we've been baptized, a lot of us, we have to repent of our sins if we find ourselves victim to those sins. If we find ourselves slaves to Satan and to unrighteousness. And so what we understand is, is repentance applies to all people, but it does apply initially as well. If you know that you, you have not been baptized, you've not had your sins removed, and you know that you're walking in a way that separates you from God and is down a path of sin, make that U-turn. Decide to do what's right. You know what's right? Do it. You have to have your sins removed from you in order to be in fellowship with God. But if you've already done that and you find yourself in, in sin, you find sin in your life that you have not dealt with, 
that you have not repented of in some way, you need to repent. Decide to leave those things behind. I promise you there's nothing of the joys of this world or the desires of our flesh that's ever going to compare to the reward that's waiting for us in heaven. If you need to make that right, don't hesitate. We're not guaranteed any other second. Make yourself right with God. Repent. Truly repent of your sins. If you're subject to that invitation tonight, why don't you come forward as we stand and as we sing.